Hi, I'm Frank Corb. Welcome to artwithcorb.com. We're going to be looking at the artist habits of mind and um, going through those today. You can take a look at this presentation using this bit.ly URL at your own pace. The eight artist habits of mind were produced and, and developed by the studies at Harvard University's Zero Project and then put into publication with Studio Thinking and Studio Thinking 2, the real benefits of a visual art education. What are the eight habits of studio thinking? How do we use them as artists? Developing craft, engaging and persisting, envisioning, expressing, observing, reflecting, stretching and exploring, and understanding community. Developing craft is learning to use tools, materials, artistic conventions, and learning to care for those tools, materials, and space. Developing craft in Jerry Saltz's 2020 book, How to Be an Artist, it's got a, a lot of different ideas. And here are just a few of them. It's not about understanding or mastery. It's about doing and experiencing. Develop forms of practice, getting into that studio and making your work. Work, 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 and start right now. Start now. No time to waste. Chuck Close has always had a great quote that I love to share, and, and I keep it on my studio door in the classroom, is inspiration is for amateurs. The rest of us just show up and get to work. And I really believe that. We don't have to be inspired by a lightning bolt or a dream, although dreams work. Sister Mary Corita Kent, the only rule is work. If you work, it will lead to something. If the people who do all of the work, it's the people who do all of the work all of the time who eventually catch on to things. And Andy Warhol, don't think about making art, just get it done. What practices do you engage in as you regularly develop your craft in the creation of your artwork? How do you encourage your students, your fellow artists, to develop their craft? Engaging and persisting is learning to embrace problems of relevance within the art world and or of imp personal importance to develop focus conductive to working and persevering at tasks. Common excuses I've heard, you've heard, we've all heard. I only paint when I'm inspired. I paint whether I feel like it or not. I paint whether I feel like it or not is my belief. My students have said frequently to me, I don't like to paint what I'm told to paint. Well, when, I'm given, when I give them the other options to paint whatever they want or to create whatever they want, sometimes it's a struggle for them to even get started. Again, I think about Chuck Close's inspirations for amateurs. The rest of us just show up and get to work. Ted Orland and David Bales in their book, Art and Fear, have a list of their students and our students and maybe some of our own excuses. I believe from their writing and from observation in the classroom and amongst other artists is that talent is rarely, distinguish is rarely distinguishable over the long run from perseverance and lots of hard work. There's a great story in Art and Fear about a ceramics professor who split the room in half and on one half he said to create as much artwork as you can. To get an A you have to have 50 pounds, B 40 pounds, C 30 pounds. And on the other side of the room he said you in the end have to produce one perfect piece. Well we all know in the end it was the people who produced a lot of art, tons of work, at least 50 pounds, who made those successful pieces. Take a read of that story. Carry a sketchbook with you all the time. Make photographs of everything that you see out there. Constantly make your work. Art's about process, not about product. And that's probably one of the most difficult things for young artists and even some older artists to remember that it's about the process of making art. What's one habit you or routine that you might have to help get you engaged and persistent?
assistant in your creation of art. Envisioning is to learning to picture mentally what cannot be directly observed and imagine possible next steps in making a piece. Twyla Tharp, the choreographer, when she begins a project, she starts with a big box, a, a lawyer's box with papers, and she throws in CDs and books and artworks and notes and videotapes and MP4s and whatever else she has at this point in time to document and to reflect back on how she gets her process. She starts with a plan, but maybe you don't have a plan. Maybe you've got a blank canvas or piece of paper or camera in front of you and that's all you need. Great, do that. Vincent van Gogh, Georgia O'Keeffe, Bertha Morisot, Laurel Birch, all great quotes on envisioning. It's important to express oneself Provide the feelings are real and taken from your own experience. Bertha Morisot. I've always enjoyed the video, the, the interview with Jasper Johns about how he developed the idea of the flag series of paintings. Started as a dream. I mentioned dreams earlier. Maybe you dream about something. There's your body of work. What are you envisioning, even as you sleep? What are two ways you go about envisioning your ideas as you create your art. Expressing is learning to create works that convey an idea, a feeling, or personal meaning. I like breaking down the ideas of expressing between, and in Jerry Saltz's case, he talks about the subject matter and the content. What's the subject matter? Well, the subject matter is what's in the painting. In our painting here, uh, the Portrait of Pope Innocent X by Diego Velázquez, and study after Velázquez's Portrait of Pope Innocent X by Francis Bacon, the subject matter is the same. In both sides, we've got a man sitting in a chair. But the intent, the message, the meaning is hugely different. And true it. What is it she tries to communicate through her art? In her day book, she talks about a lawyer and a doctor practice their callings. A plumber and a carpenter know what's gonna be required of them when they show up for a job. We as artists, we need to put ourselves out there. We need to spin our own ideas. Now, how do you go about and do that? They don't, the aforementioned artists or professionals, the lawyer, the plumber, the doctor, they don't have to create work from their interests and passions. We as artists, we've got a very different job. We do have to do that. I've struggled all my life to get maximum meaning in the simplest possible forms. What other artists can you think of who have simplified things down while still trying to express their ideas? Andy Warhol simplified it to the process, that mass production of his work. The Campbell soup cans have, you know, sometimes very little meaning, except that that's what he had for lunch, apparently, every day. But it was about that mass production. It was about that mechanical sense of how he made his work. What are three things you can do to express yourself and communicate the ideas and content in your art? Observe. Learning to attend to visual contexts more closely than ordinary looking requires, and thereby seeing things that otherwise might not be seen. This is what I tell my students. Our job as artists is to point out to the rest of the world what they're not going to otherwise see. Paul McCartney told a story about how he came up with the idea of eight days a week. He was observing his surroundings while riding in a chauffeur driven car, he heard the phrase from his driver. He asked him, how you been? And the driver said, working hard, working eight days a week. And when he told that story to John Lennon, the story was born, the song was born. So what is it that you're observing out in the real world? What is it that you observe to make your artwork? Are you like Janet Fish? where you observe every detail, every object, every reflection. Are you like Van Gogh, 
who observe the movement in space, the brush strokes, the textures. Were you like Paul Cezanne, where he looked at the shapes and simplified it down? Eugene Delacroix, Sister Wendy Beckett, Vincent van Gogh, Winslow, Winslow Homer. Again and again, I take in quick glances, and then for some reason, I've got to sit before a picture, waiting, and it's opened up like one of those Japanese flowers that you put into water. And something I thought wasn't worth more than a casual, respectful glance begins to open up depth after depth of meaning. What do you see in the world? What do you see in your work? What do you like to see? Why? What do you not like to see? And if you were to like it, what would it be that you liked about it if you had to like it? Reflection. Learning to think and talk with others about an aspect of one's work or working process and learning to judge one's own work and working process and the work of others. So how do we become more self-reflective? We write in a journal, keep notes about our work, sitting back throughout the process, stepping back from the painting, the drawing, the photography, the digital work and looking at what we're doing, shutting the lights off, putting some spots on it, getting a pizza, gathering your friends, sharing your ideas. Robert Motherwell tells a story about having a couple of canvases in his studio, one leaning against another, and he really enjoyed that relationship. The canvases had nothing to do with one another, but he enjoyed that, so he traced around the smaller canvas onto this larger ochre filled canvas and then he flipped it over he reflected on how it would look inverted and he really enjoyed that and then he came up with this entire body of work his open series he looked at two separate paintings he flipped it over gave it new ideas in addition to the looking at he thought about what open meant looked into the dictionary and came up with a poem Looking at your work from new perspectives, new angles, gives you a new view of the work in front of you. Look at it from a great distance. Squint your eyes and look at it blurred. Turn it upside down. Write about your work. Write everything you can about your work. And then give it to somebody else and see if they can tell you what's in that work. Thank you, Jerry Saltz, for that one. When you think about the work you're creating, what is it about the work that you're enjoying? What's successful about the work you're creating and what are you struggling with and why? Stretching and exploring. This is learning to reach beyond one's capacities, to explore playfully without a preconceived plan and to embrace the opportunity to learn from those mistakes. Again, it's all about the process, not the product. Try on some strong styles. Make a drawing of anything you want keeping it simple. Now, look up the following art styles, these big, strong styles, and try to create that same object in each of those. What other ones can you think of? If flowers are what you want to draw, try drawing it like Keith Haring would draw it. Try drawing it like Georgia O'Keeffe would draw it or paint it. Try to create flowers in the style of Carol Walker. What skills do you have? What skills are you lacking? It's important to rely on the skills you have, but it's just as important to consider the skills you're lacking and work to improve them. And remember, it's okay if things fail, we just try again and try it a different way. The 16th century Japanese sword fighter, Miyamoto Musashi, in a book of five rings council, never have a favorite weapon. And in her book, Twyla Tharp, she counsels, see where you're strong and where you need dramatic improvement and tackle those lagging skills first. It's harder than it sounds. Most habits are, but it's the only way to improve. What are you comfortable with, working with when you make your art? How can you use different materials to create a work that's challenging for you, yet still successful. 
can you use different materials to create the same ideas, but in a better way? And lastly, understanding community. In our case, the arts community. Learning to interact as an artist with other artists in classrooms, in local arts organizations, and across the art field, and within the broader scope of the community. In the Artist's Guide, How to Make a Living Doing What You Love by, Janet Butter, by Jackie Butterfield, she identifies a few places that one needs to focus on as you work towards being a professional artist. Jackie Butterfield talks about peer networking, researching and exhibiting in nonprofit spaces, building long-term professional relationships, and how to build a community as you survive being alone. We're never going to be George Brock or Pablo Picasso. We're never going to be that. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't rely on your friends to be your sounding board, to be that backboard to bounce ideas off of. Call upon your friends and share ideas. Critiques are essential. Go to their studio when we can. Have them come to your studio again when we can. Have a pizza party critique. Again, getting those pizzas together and talking about the work that you've got. Have work to share and have more work to share. Be ready to take and give some critical conversation, but let that flow naturally. Think about the not-for-profit organizations that are out there. There are thousands and thousands of galleries, museums, spaces we can share our work with. What are some other ones? Some other key points to have is carry business cards and use them. If, if When you go to an art event, do some research before you go. Have a plan. Always be on the lookout for opportunities and keep track of those opportunities. Building long-term professional relationships is probably one of the most important things, and this is a long-term process. Some individuals that might help you in this process just remember, it takes a lot of time. Commercial galleries, art galleries, private dealers, art advisors, people at art fairs, art consultants. Becoming a member in an artist community is really important. This is one in here in Milwaukee, uh, Milwaukee Artist Resource Network. Think about what organizations you could join to be in that common conversation. How to build a community to survive being alone? Remember, we make art by ourselves, but we need that community to help keep ourselves going. We need their advice. We need their support. Look out on the internet. Reach for friends and other artists of similar tastes or different tastes. Find support in critique groups. Work with a buddy. More time for pizza. And collectives. Think of people like the Gorilla Girls, who have an organization that is organized around a mutual goal or social action. Jerry Saltz, one more time, says it only takes a few people to make a career. Let's count. You need dealers. You need collectors. You need critics. You need curators. He says 12. I think you need more than that, but that's a start. Who do you know? Where are two or more places in your community that you can become engaged in to promote participate, volunteer, and make money in the arts. Can you name three people that you could reach out to to help you and you in turn help them? In the book, Studio Habits, it's listed in a linear fashion, but these artist habits of mind are circular. In fact, in the book, it shows a circular illustration. We have to use all of them. And it's not one, two, three, four. We skip around and use lots of them in different orders, some more than others. Different times of the day, we use more than others. Remember, in the end, it's just about making art. Please visit studiothinking.org forward slash the framework HTML. Visit their website. Check their book out on Amazon. Please visit Harvard's website, Project Zero. Visit my website, artwithcorp.com. And in the end, it's all about making art. It's all about getting into our studios, whether it's a, a studio space, a kitchen table, a back porch, a local park. 
get out there and make your art. These are such an important part of my classroom process that it's become part of not only the rubric, but the overall district umbrella standard. So down at the bottom, studio habits. How are we doing that? And even within planning and ideation, that persistence, concept, what's the idea behind it? It all fits within successful art. Again, here's the bit.ly URL for you to take a look at this at your leisure, at your own pace, to click on the links, to watch the videos, to visit the different artists. Please subscribe to artwithcorb.com. I'm again, Frank Korb. Thanks for joining me. I appreciate your time. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please reach out to me. Thanks for joining. Have a great day.